so at the end of this, in a bit of strain, me and Luke are going to show you something. Have a look at this. Oh! <laughs> okay, so that was a physics experiment to show what happens in a generator. And of course, physics deals with fundamental forces. It's actually all really very basic, very simple, and a bit dull until you come to apply it. But when you get hold of those ideas and apply those ideas, the whole world makes sense. But like I say, the problem is, it's pretty dull to watch because it's so basic and so straightforward. In fact, it's so boring and dull that when you're <laughs> explaining physics concepts, people like Brian Cox have to resort to images of spinning galaxies just to make it interesting. What you saw were vectors in operation, because in physics there are two kinds of quantities. There are scalar quantities and there are vector quantities, and vectors always have movement or direction, and very, very often, both. What me and Luke did was apply two forces on some bits of string, and they had direction, which means they were vectors, and by applying those vectors to that weight, the weight moved. And the weight moved in a completely different direction at an angle to the two vectors that Luke and I were applying. Exactly the same thing happens with a wire in a magnetic field, and a magnetic field is a vector with a direction. When we move it, it's a vector with a direction, and it gives rise to a current, which is a vector with a direction. So I don't mean it's similar, I mean it's exactly the same as pulling the weight on the floor. You apply two forces at 90 degrees, you will get a resultant vector at an angle to the two forces that have been applied. This is exactly where Fleming's right hand rule comes from. It's a description of what would happen with those vectors if you set them at 90 degrees to each other. We've got a magnetic field going that way, we move the wire that way, well the current's going to go that way, and that's all it does. It's describing how those vectors would interact at 90 degrees to each other. Those of you who are thinking about this might be asking the smart question, because in the experiment that Luke and I did, it was pretty simple. But the questions you should be asking are things like, well, what about if you change the amount of force you applied? What about if you change the angle at which you applied that force? And guess what? It would change the outcome, of course. And the same is true of generators, but generators are a much simpler system than the one Luke and I used. Because if we had friction, we also had gravity, then we had the two forces that we were applying. In a generator, you've only really got motion, field, and current. And of course, the current can only flow in and out of the wire. It's going nowhere else. So there's only two things you can really change, and that is the angle that you attack this at, the speed that you actually move it at, and the strength of the magnetic field that you apply. So it's a much simpler system, but different things happen when you change some of those factors. Of course, what we're really interested in when it comes to generators is how much can we get out of it? We want to get as much as possible by playing with those factors. Now, changing the speed is pretty obvious, and we do that quite a lot. Changing the amount of wire that goes in there is pretty obvious as well, and you want to cram in as much as you can. Changing the strength of the magnetic field will use strong magnets. Problem with that is they tend to be a bit more expensive. One of the things that people get a little confused about and doesn't get that much attention is that idea of the angle that you actually do these things at. Because, imagine that's our magnet, imagine that's our wire. If the magnetic field is coming out towards you and I move that magnet that way, according to our Fleming's rule, the current will come out that way. If I move it like that, then nothing will happen. The reason nothing happens is just like the weight on the floor. That weight was free to move. If we stopped it being able to move towards me, doesn't matter how hard I pull, it's going to move towards Luke because it's got a constraint on it. And the same is with the wire. So if I'm doing that with it, nothing's going to come out because it can't. If I do that with it, then something is going to come out. So the angle that the wire makes to the magnetic field as it flows will affect the amount of current that comes out of that wire. So that's going to be the best. That's going to be the worst. 
and that's going to give you less than that, but more than that. So the angle really, really matters. So here's a serpentine call we made in a previous video, and let's analyse it in terms of those angles we've just been talking about and how it's going to affect generation. Now, because it's a circle, of course, it's a narrower here than it is here, because it's a circle. This section here is going at the wrong angle. It's at 90 degrees to the field, so that section's going to generate nothing, as is that section. Now, because you've wound it this way, we've had to put this at an angle in order to get from one point to the other point. And, of course, that being angled means it's going to generate less than if it was straight. So, if we want to improve this, then we need to make this as short as possible. And we need to put this as straight as possible. And we'll get the most out of this kind of serpentine coil. So, what do we do? Well, we can twist the serpent around. Then if we do that, we get this. I designed this in Tinkercad, and as you can see, all I've done is turn that serpent around 90 degrees. So instead of running like that, it runs up and down. Now, the um, Tinkercad files are available. I've put them up there, and you're quite welcome to download them. But you can see, if I wind the serpentine coil, then because it's no longer going in a circle that way, then there's less wire at 90 degrees. I mean, we need the wire at 90 degrees because we have to join them up. But there's far less there. And because they're now going equally, they're going to go much straighter. So this is going to be a huge improvement on this. So to put this together, I used this. It's a thrust bearing. The outside diameter is 35 millimeters, the inside diameter is 22 millimeters, and it's 10 millimeters thick. And I just bought it from Amazon. Then I printed two parts, the housing and the rotor. In the housing, there's a thrust bearing there in the printed recess. And then we have the race there, and I've got an 8mm bar going out to the height of this. That completes that bit apart from the coil. The rotor, which is the second bit that you're going to print again, got the other side of the thrust bearing in the recess. 22mm bearing, 22mm bearing, so that it can sit on that bit of bar. And then around the edge in a north-south, north-south, I've got these, which are N35 neodymium magnets, 10mm by 2mm. They go in there and that finishes the rotor, so the rotor sits nicely in there like that. The only thing we've got to do then is put our twisted serpent around there. To make that, here we go, it's just one big coil, and I've done a number of videos on how I make these. I just wind the coil, and then there's bits of tape holding the coil together, and those bits of tape match up with those sections there. So I've got to bend this into shape, and to bend it into shape, it's a piece of cake, you just do that with it, matching the two bits of tape with each other. You do that all the way around, and then we can bang that onto a stator. Okay, quick and dirty test, LED. Now, an interesting point is this is not only easier to do than a standard call. We've got so many standard calls to make, there's 36 of them. But because it's a serpent, then the bit that would be in a standard call going across the top, well, it isn't there. And because it isn't there, it isn't wasted wire. That makes it more power dense than if you bothered to wind separate coils. So these serpent coils have a lot going for them. Anyway, let's give it a spin. <laughs> That's pretty cool, of course, we've got to get a voltage out of this. Okay, we did that by hand, got a few volts out of it, I've wrapped a pull cord around it, and we'll see what we get. 45 volts! <laughs> Whoa! 49. Yeah! Look at the balance on <laughs> Well, that's a bit awesome. <laughs> this could spin for ages, eh? Huh? Wow. That's just on that bearing. <laughs> that actually worked better than I thought it would do. That was awesome. It, it, it just went on for ages. We made that flywheel. It'd be brilliant. So there we go, the Twisted Serpent Generator. It's cheaper. Better, easier than any other generator I've ever seen. I think it's pretty awesome and there are good reasons why that would be so. I've made the files freely available on Tinkercad. It's called the Twisted Serpent. So just go to Tinkercad, look for Robert Murray Smith, look for Twisted Serpent and 
that is there for you to print if you want to make your own copy of it. All the and I'm amazed! <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to like and subscribe. And clearly, you can glue this into anything you wanted.